One of the main reasons why AMD FX was so underwhelming is due to its unique architecture. I know that a lot of my viewers are already aware of this, but for those of you who are not, every module of an FX processor has two cores in it, and every two cores share an FPU, L2 cache, and the front end, which is something AMD did not only because they believed that floating point workloads are going to be handled by the GPU, but also to reduce the die size and cost. Intel processors of the time, on the other hand, didn't share those components, which predictably resulted in better performance. Another important reason why FX sucked that basically no one talks about is the fact that Bulldozer was supposed to release in 2009. That is, two years before it actually came out, and today we're going to see what would happen if FX wasn't delayed. Now, the FX CPU that I have is an 8350, which is the second generation of FX processors that released in 2012, and it is about 15% better than first gen, but I still thought it would be interesting to see how second gen FX stacks up against a first generation Core i7, and if things could have been different for AMD had they released Bulldozer or Piledriver in 2009. For the specs of the Intel platform, we have an ASUS X58 Rampage 3 formula and 24GB of DDR3 memory in triple channel, while for the AMD platform we're using a 990FXA UD3 Revision 4 motherboard paired with 16GB of DDR3 memory in dual channel. For the graphics card, we're using an RX 6600 XT, and both systems are being powered by a 700W FSP Hydro power supply. Now, some of you mentioned in the past that using the 8 lane 6600 XT on a PCIe 2.0 motherboard reduces performance significantly, and that using the other GPU that I have instead, which is the RTX 2070 that has 16 lanes, will result in much higher performance. As we saw in my previous video, that is not very true, and the only couple of games where the 6600 XT performed worse due to bandwidth limitation are God of War and Dying Light 2, yet it's no big deal since we can still see which processor performs better in those titles. Both Spectre and Meltdown patches were disabled on the Intel platform, which is something I forgot to do with the FX system, though AMD processors are only affected by Spectre anyways. You don't even have the option to disable Meltdown on AMD processors, and disabling the Spectre protection would result in less than 5% improvement, so it's nothing to worry about. The gameplay footage was taken using AMD's Instant Replay feature, which can result in a performance decrease ranging from 0 and up to 15% on both systems, depending on the game. Finally, when it comes to performance results, we will have a quick look at how these CPUs compare at stock, though we're mainly going to focus on overclocking results, and you'll understand why in just a minute. Alrighty, let's begin with stock results and let's have a quick look at how these CPUs stack up against each other in software. Kicking things off, we have Cinebench R15, where the i7-960 takes the lead when it comes to single core by 4%, though the FX8350 is better when it comes to multi-core performance by 24%. I'd like you to pay attention to the multiplier ratio of each CPU. As you can see, for the 8350, it's 6.5, while the i7-960 only has a 5x ratio. For reference, an 8-core 8 8-thread 8 processor with a fixed clock speed that doesn't share resources the way they're shared on an FX processor, such as the 9700K, has a multiplier ratio of around 7.6. The reason I'm talking about this is because I hear and see a lot of people mention that an 8-core AMD FX processor is actually a quad-core, even though it's 8 cores, 
with shared resources scale much better than four cores with hyperthreading and nearly as well as a traditional eight core design, at least in Cinebench, so I want people to understand that. And just in case you're like one of the Steves from Gamers Nexus or Hardware Unboxed who don't like to listen carefully, no, I'm not claiming an 8-core FX to be as fast as a 9700K. More on this later. Performance in the following software is as follows. The FX8350 has an 11% lead in Corona, 39% in V-Ray, 8% in Blender BMW, and finally a 9% lead in Blender Classroom. We will have a look at more software results in just a moment, but here we can see the weak side of AMD FX. In some cases, like in V-Ray, or compression and decompression workloads, video encoding and transcoding, which are other areas where FX performs exceptionally well, the uplift compared to 4 cores and 8 threads of a first gen i7 is pretty big, though there are also situations where performance unfortunately doesn't scale as well due to shared resources that can be a bottleneck to those 8 integer cores. When it comes to gaming results at stock, there is really not much to talk about. The FX8350 is simply capable of delivering a higher frame rate and a slightly more consistent frame time or performing right in line with the i7-960, so I didn't see a point in testing more games. One of the reasons for that is the low memory clock on the Intel platform. By default, we're getting 1066 mega transfers, while on the AMD side, it is 1866 mega transfers, which is a huge difference. So let's have a quick look at temps and power consumption and move on to overclocking results to see how these CPUs stack up once we push them to their limits. Looking at temps, the 8-core FX hits 37 degrees Celsius, while the i7-960 reaches 65 degrees using Intel Burn Test in a 21 degree room. Now, FX processors don't really report the correct temperature below 45 degrees, but I highly doubt that temperature readings are 30 degrees off with FX, and the heat output does seem to be higher with the i7. Another way we can look at it is by checking how far away each processor is from throttling. For FX, the throttling temperature is 80 degrees, while for the i7, it's 95 degrees, meaning there is a delta T of 43 and 30 degrees respectively. When it comes to power consumption, the 8350 does pretty good at idle, yet under load, it consumes slightly more power than the first gen i7. Okay, so now let's move on to overclocking results. Both systems were overclocked as much as possible. For the Intel platform, we have a 4.1 GHz CPU OC with a 1723 mega transfer memory OC, while for the AMD system, we have 4.7 GHz and 2034 mega transfer overclocks for the CPU and memory respectively. Looking at benchmarks, we can see that the first gen i7 gains an impressive uplift compared to stock. One of the reasons for that is because we overclocked the i7 by 900 MHz on all cores, while with FX we're 700 MHz above the stock all core frequency. And another reason is because FX processors gain slightly less performance compared to Intel when overclocking. In Cinebench, the i7 now has a 15% advantage in single core, the same cannot be said about multi-core, though the gap is quite a bit smaller now. Let's have a look at the multiplier ratio of both processors once again. As you remember, the 9700K with a locked frequency has a ratio of 7.58, when the overclocked 8350 is sitting at 6.69, while the i7 is at 5.10. And if each processor had the same IPC and was clocked the same, this is how the benchmark would look. What this tells us is that with FX, AMD actually managed to achieve a level of performance that wasn't too far behind from what you'd get if AMD didn't share those resources between two cores, and they could have totally counterweighed the performance hit with architectural and IPC improvements. Of course, once again, it's not all about Cinebench, like we saw there are cases 
when performance does get reduced due to shared resources, but I still believe that FX had potential and performance could have been improved with upcoming generations. When it comes to the rest of software results, the i7 only manages to outperform the 8350 using Intel burn test, while in the rest it falls behind, though in most cases not by a significant margin. Moving on to gaming results, the i7 just performs extremely well. The only game where both CPUs perform similarly is Apex Legends, while in the rest of the titles, the FX 8350 loses, especially in games like Cyberpunk, Forza, and God of War. It is really unfortunate that the first gen i7 doesn't have AVX support, meaning you can't play games such as Warzone 2, Death Stranding, Resident Evil 8, and many more, even though I'm sure it would deliver a playable experience in those titles. What did you find? Tracks. Not deer, though. I'll keep looking. What did you find? Tracks. Not deer, though. I'll keep looking. Looking at temps, we can confirm that it is much easier to cool the FX 8350 with the same cooler. The i7 is basically on the verge of throttling, while with FX we still have a 20 degree headroom. And if you're wondering why I didn't overclock it even further, is because I lost the silicon lottery. This sample requires 1.52 volts to achieve a 4.7 GHz overclock, and going any further is simply not worth it since voltage requirements become exponential with higher clocks. Power consumption wise, the situation is similar to stock. At idle, the FX8350 does pretty good, though under load it consumes slightly more power than the i7-960. I don't know about you, but I believe that FX processors had potential and would have had a better reputation had Piledriver or maybe even Bulldozer released in 2009, because that would mean AMD has two years before the release of Sandy Bridge, which is enough time to make architectural improvements and increase performance. I mean, just look at Ryzen, the jump in performance as well as efficiency from first to third gen in just two years is quite big. And if AMD managed to achieve a 25 to 30% IPC uplift with FX by 2011, 
I have a feeling an 8 core FX wouldn't have had any issues with competing or even outperforming a Sandy Bridge i7. Even if AMD released FX in 2009 with the same price as Bulldozer came out, I think they would have been totally fine. The i7-960 had an MSRP of $562, not to mention prices of X58 boards. The cheapest 4-core 8-thread Intel CPU at the time, the i7-860, which by the way doesn't have triple channel support since it's an LGA-1156 CPU, was priced at $284, and I'm sure an 8350 with a $245 MSRP would have no issues going against it, at least at stock. As we all know though, that's not what ended up happening. Unfortunately, by the time FX came out, they were obsolete, but it definitely would have been interesting to see how things would have turned out if AMD released Bulldozer on time, and perhaps 8-core Steamroller and Excavator processors would have seen the light of day. Anyways, that's been it. Feel free to check out other videos on my channel and stay tuned for the i7-2600K as well as the Xeon X5670 revisits. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to leave a like, subscribe for more content and I'll see y'all in the next one.